That's like going to war. You know, when you get in that foxhole in a war, that's where you buy, that's where you bond, right? But I loved it. I loved every moment of it. When I talk about I want to be somebody so bad, it just ate me up inside. I see that in you. There ain't nobody like me. Folks, how do you do it? How did you do it? How did you dadgum do it? How can a ragtag army didn't have a punt to pee in, explode and dominate the largest industry in the world? It's been said that every journey starts with a single step. Some journeys, however, just seem impossible. In 1977, the life insurance industry looked like a mountain that was impossible to climb. The 100-year-old life insurance industry was the largest in the world. The behemoth held 60% of America's assets, held incredible political influence, controlled every regulator, the media, and had a network of 250,000 agents across the entire country. 90% of all life insurance in force was cash value, one of the worst financial products ever sold to the American public simply because it paid a higher commission. Term insurance, which offered more protection for families at a fraction of the cost, was only sold to 10% of the public. How could anyone change 100 years of history, influence, and market domination? They ain't nobody ever designed a test, nor will they design a test that can measure the heart of a man or a woman. In February of 1977, 85 men and women from every walk of life took that first step on a journey that would completely change the face of the largest industry in American business. 100 years of history would be rewritten in only 13 years. An army of coaches, policemen, teachers, and nurses, mostly part-time, were on a crusade to do a better job for American families and to change the financial destiny of their families forever. Folks, if you can see yourself winning again, if you want to be somebody, if you want to control your own destiny, if you want to do something exceptional with your life, I'll promise you A.O. Williams will give you a chance to be somebody you're proud of. Okay, I got this much to go, y'all, so hang in here. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going give to get into the five fundamentals of our, the way we did business. Uh, but I, I want to lay the groundwork. I mean, I want you to understand how we came about uh, this incredible system. I want to be somebody so bad it just ate me up inside. You know what I, you know what I mean when I say that? I mean, I wanted to be something so bad, it just, it ate me up inside. It was, uh, it was unbelievable. In 1966, I was a football coach in Columbus, Georgia, making $10,700 a year. When you got a wife and two kids, my first year in coaching, I was made $4,600. You always got a second job. And most of the time, I was refereeing basketball games. After football season, I'd run up down that basketball court for three hours and make $12. And... Uh, you, you know when somebody like me wants to be somebody, just eating up with it. You know, if, if I walk down town Atlanta and you see these big office buildings down there and I walked in one of these big famous buildings and uh, I said, look, I, I, I want to be somebody. I want to apply for a job. And the personnel director said, well, what job do you want to apply for? And I said, well, I want to be, what's the top job around this place? And it was a CEO. I said, give me that application. That's what I want to be. You, you, you understand a football coach with a PE degree? You understand they would, they would not eat, they, they wouldn't eat, they, they wouldn't even take the application, much less consider it, right? See, nobody thought I could run a big company. Nobody thought that I was all that special, that I could do anything incredible. But you know what? I thought I was. I thought I was. And I wanted to have a chance to prove it. All I wanted was a chance. I wanted some company to give me a chance. And you know what? 
in December 1966, ITT gave me a chance. For $100, they let me get an insurance license and a securities license. It took me three months, March of that year, before I could go make my first sale. You know what? what? With that little $100, getting that insurance license and a securities license, that opened up a whole different world to this football coach. You understand that? I was like a Superman insurance agent. Now, I didn't sell life insurance. I replaced trash value insurance. Right, I, I'd, I'd cut their costs 70 or 80%. We weren't talking about little old bitty nickel and dime crap, right? I'm talking about thousands and tens of thousands of dollars, right? And I'd give them a savings program, put them in a mutual fund with an IRA, and at the end of that cycle, they'd be worth $300,000 more, $500,000 more, or a million dollars more, right? I was like a superstar banker. Bankers screw you almost as bad as insurance companies, right? I mean, you got a credit card and you borrow money on your credit card and you don't pay it off every month. They charge you 17, 27%, right? But you go save money with them. They pay you 1% or 2%, right? Well, it took me a while, but I figured out how to screw the banks, right? You go, you go use their credit card for convenience, like right now, I ain't even got it here, but I, I, I don't carry a bill for with me. I carry a little cash ease, uh, a few bills, and uh, a, a driver's license and a credit card. And I charge every, even if I buy Diet Coke, it, it, a shopping thing when I'm buying gas, I make them use my credit card, right? Because I'm using the bank's money and I pay it off every month and I don't pay them nothing. Ain't that something I love, especially Citigroup, right? I mean, I love it. I, you know, I, became, I, I figured out how the stockbrokers were screwing you. I'd churn in accounts and all that kind of crap, right? I figured out how the hedge fund people were screwing you, right? I took this thing serious. And that's why I accumulated $291,000 in two and a half years part-time. Those three months that I was getting my securities license, my insurance license, I taught all my teacher friends, my coaching friends, parents of my players, uh, uh, friends of mine, and 100% of them, if you, back then, if you were in middle America, 100% of them had trash bay life insurance. Then I had another bolt of lightning hit me. ITT sponsored Napoleon Hill at a seminar downtown Atlanta before I met you, Bobby. I went down there. He, he was the author of Think and Grow Rich, the most famous business book back then sold at that time. Napoleon said, I spent my entire adult life looking for the secret, looking for the one thing, the one thing that all these successful people did to be successful. Now, see, you get my attention when you say that, right? He spent, it, that's what he read, he spent his entire adult life doing that, right? I never read that whole book, and I think maybe it's got to page 175 or whatever it was, I found that formula. Here it is, you got it in that little, don't look at it right now, okay? You can look at it later. But folks, I sat down there and I figured out that thing. It took me a week or two or three. I figured that baby out. Those six steps, you know, you could use these six steps to be successful in a lot of other ways. I used it to be financially independent, right? And I figured out a way. I, I, folks, I wanted to quit 10 million times in this business, but I'd have this thing posted on my daily calendar. I had it posted on my mirror in my bathroom and I'd look at this thing and I'd say, man, in 10 years, I was going to be financially independent. And I said, if I could just hang in there, if I could just hang in there, you know what? what? You know what? what? Everybody I recruited for a number of years, I made them fill this thing out. I helped them fill this thing out. Do you have any idea what it's like for a football coach whose parents never had any money, he never had any money, to see himself having a chance to become financially independent where nobody could put their thumb on him? He could tell the world to take a flying leap. You know how wonderful, you know how unbelievable that is? That's the kind of opportunity we gave him at A.O. Williams. I wanted to build a company for people like me that weren't so pretty, that weren't so smart, but they had a hunger and desire to be somebody that was unbelievable. I didn't want to build a company when we thought about A.L. Williams for those Harvard people, those Yale's people, those Dress for Success crowd, those big IQs, those brilliant people, those pretty people. I wanted to build a company like you build a football team. I didn't care where you came from. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't care what your education was. We'd put a uniform on you. We'd put you out there on the field and we'd beat you up. But if you were tough enough, if you wanted it bad enough, 
if you were willing to sacrifice, pay the price, we'll give you a chance. And all I wanted was a chance with that idea. February 10, 1977, A.O. Williams was born. Let me tell you my story. It really sounds hokey, but it's true. My dad died when I was a junior at Mississippi State at age 48 of a heart attack. He was sold, sold too little of the wrong kind of insurance. My mom was like most of the mom in the 50s. She didn't have an education, so she worked in the home. I had two younger brothers at home. I saw firsthand what it was like for mama to have that responsibility dumped on her shoulders. She sold antiques. She did all kind of jobs, you know, just to make ends meet. Uh, I, 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 we had one of our babies in college and one after college. We got married at 18. My first coaching job, I was paid $4,600 a year. One of my players, daddies, worked with Gulf Life Insurance Company, says, Art, I need to come talk to you about your insurance. I knew I needed it because my dad had died and I left my mother in a mess, and I didn't have any. He came and showed me uh, insurance and all that crap, you know, and I didn't want, I was a football coach. I didn't want to know nothing about insurance. I didn't want to know nothing about investments. I just wanted somebody I trusted to tell me what I needed. Here I was, well, my dad, my dad is one of my football players, for heaven's sakes. And he, I said, he said, how much can you afford? I said, $20. He said, well, I can give you a $15,000 policy. I didn't question that. I, I, you know, I thought he was a good guy. Five years later, I went to a family reunion at my mother's house in Cairo, Georgia. My accountant cousin, Ted Harrison, came there, and he showed me the concept to buy term and invest the difference. And he says, Art, you're getting screwed. You know, uh, you can get $150,000 worth of insurance for the same thing you're paying for fifteen. dollars That was like lightning striking me. To that moment in my life, I didn't care about nothing but coaching football. I suppose it's hard to believe. It, it sounds hokey, but it's the truth. Three days later, that was my mama lived in Cairo, Georgia. I was coaching in Columbus, Georgia, about a three-hour drive. Uh, we drove back uh, three days later. I dropped Angela and the kids off at the house. I went to the Bradley Memorial Library, and I said, I just don't believe my cousin's telling me all there is to know about this crap. And so I go down, and I get money's worth and changing time, whatever, you know, a few things, and they all said the same thing. Cash value is a ripoff. Why, you've got young kids. You know, you need a lot of insurance. You know that decreasing responsibility theory, right? right? And I said, wow. And uh, three weeks later, this is a true story. It sounds hokey. I go to a PTA meeting. I bet you seven years coaching, I never went to but three PTA meetings. You know, I go to a PTA meeting. At the break, I go meet Forrest Smith. His son didn't play football, so I didn't know him. We're sitting there talking, and I asked him what he does. He said, I'm the division manager with ITT Financial Services. We sell mutual funds. are pretty much an investment company and uh, term insurance. I said, wow. Why, why is all this happening to me like this? So, so I have a couple of conversations with him. I was coach of the year that year. And, and he says, Art, you know, you ought to come full time because I was passionate. I was beginning to get really passionate about this stuff, you know. And he said, man, with your reputation, you know, you could, you could blah, blah, blah. And uh, so I said, you've got to be kidding me. Good people don't sell life insurance. You understand that? <laughs> People, people find out you sell life insurance, they cross the street to avoid talking to you. Ain't that right? Every public opinion poll ever taken, what people think good jobs out there on the bottom of the totem pole is funeral home directors, used car salesmen, and life insurance agents, right? I mean, I walk down the street, people say, hi, coach. How you doing, coach? Great win last night, coach. How are we going to do next year, coach? So after two or three times, he said, well, aren't you off in the summer? Uh, why don't you get your license and just, you know, I can consider you full-time. Back then, the part-time concept had not yet been born. And so I said, that sounds like a good deal. And so I uh, signed up. Takes me three months to get licensed. Three months after I, you know, pay my $100, I'm going to take my test, pass it. And I picked up my policies of Robert Kelly, one of my assistant football coaches. He had what everybody I talked to had. He had a $15,000 whole life policy. I go, and he had $50 a month going to the teacher's credit union making 2 or 3%. I go in there in 45 minutes. Remember, I used to run down that basketball coach for three hours and make $12. And nobody had told me, this was four months after my cousin told me about buy term investment. There was three months after I paid my $100 to get my license. Nobody told me about the money. I came in here because I was passionate 
about buy term and invest the difference. I hated trash value. I hated those prudential agents. I hated what they did to my mama. I hated what that prayer's dad did to my, uh, me and Angela. And uh, so I go in there and I do the same thing for him that my cousin talked to me about. I was able to take the same money he was paying, 15000 give him 100000 term, take the $50 a month he was getting 2 or 3% on, put him in a mutual fund, getting 10%. We get through with that. My manager, who went with me for the first and only time, he said, all right, let's go have a cup of coffee and figure out, uh, you know, let's check you out and all that crap. So we go sit down and do all that crap. And he says, let's figure, this is four months now after I heard but by term of it's a difference. He said, all right, let's figure out how much money you made. He said, all right, you just made $324. Folks, I've made a lot of money in my life. I've had a lot of gigantic paychecks. I've never had one like that. That's the biggest paycheck I ever got in my life. It opened up a whole new world for me. I believe with everything that's in me, my passion made me what I was. My passion made me what I was. I ain't smart enough to be what I was. You know, I ain't talented enough. It was my passion, Eves. It was my passion. It was my passion. It's got to be more than the money. The money's got to be second. That's what City didn't understand. Coach Lombardi understood it. Coach Lombardi said, you capture a person's heart, you capture the person. A.O. Williams captured my heart. Think about this, folks. Think about this. What are the odds of 85 people in one city, one state versus 250,000 people, every city, every town, every state becoming number one, destroying trash value life insurance? Just think about this. How, how could that happen? How could that happen? Because we were able to create a con. Let me, let me tell you. You simplify. Let me just talk about simplifying. There's three things. Burn it. Uh, no limits. I wanted Bobby Busan and all these original guys to look at every person in A.O. Williams as an RVP. We talked about that. That's where you get to own your own business. If you come full time, you know the biggest surprise I had in my old recruiting career is when I came to work at ITT, I was going to come see if I could hire part-time people. They didn't hire part-time people. That's, I sold them on the idea of hiring part-time sales force, right? And I found out that 90% of the people hated their full-time job. I didn't hate my full-time job. I loved my full-time job. That blew me away, right? And so all of a sudden, I had to change plans, right? And we had to create an incredible full-time opportunity. And so we created an opportunity with no limits, where you could come to work with us part-time, but if you wanted to, you could come full-time. You could become an RVP. You could own your own business. You could go anywhere you want to. There was no limit on income. There was no limit on promotion. There was no limit on, on territory. Ain't that something? Yes. Ain't that something? Yes. You know what? what? Y'all don't do that. Then, that ain't good enough. If you've got no limits, then you've got to understand how to simplify Make it simple, right? And transferable, right? Right? As you start this incredible growth like Bobby had, you know, you got people all over 50 states or 45 states, whatever he is, you got to be able to talk a you know, common language, right? You can't be out there like this guy got his own guidelines, this guy's got his own guidelines, this guy's got all the way to be agree. I, like, I, I can't understand that, right? And, uh, then you've got to understand how to multiply. You know, if you've got the greatest opportunity in the world with no limits, and you can simplify and transfer it, but you ain't got nobody to transfer it to, you ain't ever going to get big, right? You've you got to have no limits. You've got to be able to simplify and transfer something, and then you've got to understand how to make the multiples work for you. Ain't that right? I'm not going to read this because I'm getting a sore throat. Okay. This is prudential. I wouldn't take a million dollars for this. This is prudential's rate book right here. And this is A.O. Williams' playbook right here. <laughs> One page. Do you know, you know, not only is trash value the lousiest investment 
product ever created by the minds of a human scum-sucking dog, right? Right? But you know what's lower than the person that created that product? The person that would own term insurance and sell that shit to somebody, right? Ain't that right? And do you know what? 90% of those jokers own term insurance and sold that crowd, right? Ain't that something? Ain't that something? See, we figured all this, right? We figured, we figured out how to simplify and transfer things, right? I showed you my presentation a while ago, right? Okay. All right, look at this baby. All right, then, then, we get, then we have to get a simple kind of way to do business, right? Now, I know y'all don't do multiples and y'all not interested in promoting RVPs. I mean, I watch some of you, okay? And, uh, but this is, this is what we did, right? We would recruit four and five pointers, 90%. We want to see y'all to, hey, <laughs> I don't want this to sound ugly, you know, but, but, you know, I had some people I love in here that asked me to tell it to you like it is, you know? So, I mean, you know, you can hate me. I, I guarantee you there's some people at Prime America in here and especially somewhere down the road <laughs> go hate me for saying some of this stuff. And I don't want them to. I don't mean it that way. You understand that? But you would have no respect for me if I didn't tell you, Gus, how it was, right? I mean, you might not agree with it, and you might, you might not like me for it, right? But I don't care. I want you to respect me, right? You got to have recruiting standards. We had recruiting standards today, O. Williams. We recruited four and five pointers, 90%. The recruit sets up the appointment. Isn't that something? You know, my biggest fear in coming full time was how do you get appointments? How do you get, I wasn't going, I never cold called in my life. I never knocked on a stranger's door. I never went to a stranger's house, right? I'd rather dig ditches and do that. So the recruit sets up the appointment with his best friend, right? And the recruit goes with you. Ain't that something? Ain't that something? And there's no pressure, no selling on the first. I know you're going to think I'm beating this to death before I'm over, but that's stupid, folks, to sell on the first interview. Now, I know I got some good friends in Primerica today that say, oh, you know what? We're in a minority market. They ain't got insurance out there. And it'd be awful if they died in the next two days before we got this thing issued, you know, so I'm going to screw them and sell them something with pressure. And there they got it. Right? Except I tell you, folks, you don't sell on the first interview. You're in there to build a relationship because you're trying to get eventually a recruit and a sales leader and a district leader and a division leader and an RVP and an NSD, right? And if you go in there and slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, kind of high pressure, all that kind of crap, right? And then you repeat, you repeat, you repeat. Now, you know how long it takes somebody, Gus, to figure that, to understand that, to transfer it? I wrote Common Sense. It's the best thing ever written. It's the only thing I ever had inspiration in my life. I used to keep a scratch pad when I was coaching by my bed at night. And if I thought of something, a play or a defense or something like that, if I didn't write it down, I'd forget it the next day, right? I'd been looking. Where's my book? Hey, we use this book. Bobby, you remember Scott Reynolds wrote this book. <laughs> who, can read, who can understand this crap? I mean, look at that. Little old bitty print, you know. <laughs> that's what we used about a year or two. And, and, and all of a sudden, I had an inspiration. One night I said, wow, people ain't going to read this, but they'll read a magazine. You go sit in a dentist chair or getting your toenails fixed or something, you know, and they got a people magazine, you'll pick that up, right? And I said, you know what? Somebody needs to write a book. It's like a magazine. It needs to have some color. And it needs to have some big old type. And it needs to have some pictures in it and some graphs, right? It needs to be printed in seventh grade language. You know what? And common sense was born. And best I remember, I took it back to the war room the next day, and Bob Buson was one of five people that said it ain't no good. <laughs> and all it did, all it did was sell 16 million copies. Sold 500,000 copies a month. You want to, you want to know something else? A.L. Williams had the largest printing company in the Southeast. I went over there one day. It blew me away. Blew me away. It was like the New York Times printing press, a whole big old thing out there with machines running and all that crap. You, you know how much 500,000 copies of this 
uh, room it takes up, about a gym. The nastier they got, and they were nasty. Folks, we were in a war. I mean, it, it, was, it was unbelievable. The harder we fought. You know, the thing I remember most, I think, about the early days, one, one of the things I think the most about the early days, is how our people, those 85 people, they recruited, they recruited, they had standards. They had standards. You know, if I had to have one word, one couple, three words to describe who we were and, and how we did business, we were a warm market company. We were a warm market company. I mean, that sort of says it all, right? We didn't believe in cold calling. We didn't believe on knocking on strangers' doors, handing out leaflets, going to a carnival, you know, and handing suckers and balloons out to the family to get names and crap like that, right? We had standards. And we recruited four and five pointers. Now, that's married, got kids, on a home, got a job, 25 to 55. Now, uh, the company didn't have a rule to get four and five pointers. We just figured out... <laughs> These were our friends. These were people that were leaders and influential people in a community, and they had friends. And it was a way, if you did a good job for them, that, that you could recruit them, and they'd take you to their friends, and you could stay in a warm mart, right? It just, it just was common sense. It wasn't any kind of really brilliant deal. We had to overcome, in those early days, slow pay. It took us two or three months to get a policy issued. Can you imagine that? So you go in and you, you close a sale on the first interview. Well, we had to wait two or three months to, 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 to issue the policy. So we had to do something with them in those two or three months, right? And so we didn't want to make the sale. We tried to build a relationship. We made them our friends. We invited them to our house. We took them to ball game. We had parties. We built friends, right? Well, it took us two, we had to get insurance and security slides. So that took us two or three months to get them. Uh, no advance, I've already told you about that. Rather than get $150, you got $12.50, but you got that for 12 months, right? Uh, you had to get a blood test, you know, if you sold a $100,000 policy. I told you about them passing a law that you had to, you couldn't, it, this, that's almost unbelievable. You couldn't replace a trash value policy with term unless you picked it up and did all that crap, right? Not only slow pay, but low pay. See, back then, there was no full-time part-timers. They fitted us into a, uh, I can put this right here. They, they fitted us into the full-timers pay schedule. We just had to go along with what they were doing, right? So they had a salesperson, a district leader, that's what I was, and a division leader. That was the only three positions. So we had to fit in there. So look at this. If I was field training a person, which I did that first year full-time, I was trying to build part-time sales force, if uh, we sold a $200 commission on a $100,000 policy, let's say, the salesperson made, out of field training made $100, I made a 10% override, $10, no, that'd be $20, right? $20, 10% commission. But my check, three months later, would be $1.85. Hey, hey, four and a half years. That's what I lived, that's what we did. That's what we did. That's what we did. Uh, so slow pay and low pay, it forced us to have better standards in our recruiting, to build relationships. Wow. A.L. Williams believed in recruiting part-timers. Why? Why? Because you could recruit quality. You could recruit a better quality person. You weren't going to go in there and get a good coach or a good dentist or a good nurse uh, to give up their job, their salary, their benefits to go full-time selling life insurance, right? So that's why we created a part-time opportunity. Not only slow pay, low pay, but we had administrative problems out in the gazoo. Let me just give you a couple of them. A.L. Williams hit this industry like an atomic bomb. In New Jersey, an example, their licensing department would have two people. All the other insurance companies would recruit maybe 20 people uh, a month. And we had hit them with a thousand. Uh -oh, our home office, the first company, had five employees. Uh, our second company, National Home Life, was the world's largest, uh, what do you call that? The mail order business. Art Linkletter was their celebrity spokesman. They'd sell you a $10,000 policy, whole life policy, 
And it was an automatic issue, right? They didn't care if you were, had cancer and you were on your last day of life. You know, they just automatic issue. Then we'd hit them with 90,000 policies that they'd have to underwrite and issue. So not only did we have slow pay, low pay, administrative problems out the kazoo, but I saved $291,000 <laughs> part-time. Ain't that something? Now, how did we compete? Is this boring to you people? No. You know, I really, I started putting this together. I told Angela, I said, you know what? They've heard all this crap. I don't think I've ever done this in one session. I still got a lot to go. Uh, but, but you know, but uh, see, I love you. I love it too. You know, hey, I don't make nothing off this deal. You, you know, I, I just, I, you know what? You know, I'm financially independent, even though I lost a lot of money with Citigroup. But you know what? You know what? The greatest joy you get in your life when you look back at it, when you get old like me, I'm 76 years old, uh, is to think you help somebody. Now, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to help everybody in this room the next day and a half, but there's going to be somebody in here I'm going to help. You're going to leave here, you're going to leave here a little bit tougher, a little bit meaner, you know? See, see, uh, how, how did we compete with the most powerful machine in the United States at that time? We didn't have their money, but we had something better than money. We found their weakness, and we took them to the kitchen table, and we showed the family how they had been screwed. See, see, I never saw A.O. Williams, even in the early days, I never saw A.O. Williams as a multi-level marketing company where you recruit anybody with no standards. Anybody's got $100, you recruit them. You bring prospects to a meeting first. You sell them on the first interview. You force everybody to buy a product whether they need it or not. I never, I never forced a single person to buy life insurance in my life. I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. What A.O. Williams did was impossible. As I look back on all the slow paid, low pay, administrative problems, everything seems so hard. Everything, as I look at it now, it seems so hard. I started working in the fifth grade. My daddy brought me a 52 Studebaker when I was 15. Didn't have a driver's license. You could do that back then. And uh, taught me something about ownership I never forgot. I remembered it when we started A.O. Williams, though. Uh, I played football in college. That was hard, playing football and going to school. My dad died at 48. That was hard. That was hard when I saw my mama go through. Angela and I got married at 18 had two babies before we were 22 or 23. And that was hard going to school. First coaching job making $4,600. That was hard. We had one car for the first two or three years I was coaching. When I started making a little money, I bought an all-state red scooter. We took Bobby and Red's kids on that red jet a million times. That's what I had for a second car for two or three years was a red scooter. Uh, at ITT, having to get insurance license, security license, taking two and three months to get light. That was hard. First check, making $9.46. That was hard. Regulators investigating you over and over, pyramid, cold, all kind of, that was hard. But you know what? what? You know what? what? Back then it didn't seem hard. Because every, that was the way it was supposed to, I, everything I did all my life was hard. It was just the way it was. I thought it made big money to build a big organization, to become financially independent. I expected it to be hard. And it was hard, but I didn't think about it being hard because everything was hard. I know this. We loved it. We loved it. In the toughest of times, we still loved it. We loved getting together and telling the war stories. We loved it. But you know one reason we loved it? Because we were the ones that started the fight. We threw the first punch. We threw the first punch. You know, all our families have been screwed with trash value, and we wanted to hit them in the nose. We wanted to hit them in the nose. A.L. Williams was on a mission to destroy trash value life insurance, and we did. We trained crusaders. We trained warriors. I cannot tell you the number of people, not just Primerica, but I can't tell a lot of Primerica, training from Prudential and all these other places out there, training insurance agents. 
I, we didn't train insurance agents. We trained crusaders. I never had a surgeon tell me any sales secret. I never went to a training program. I never taught a training program on sales techniques. All we did was talk about a crusade. All we did was build warriors. John Roy, come up here. Come up here. We got, we got. Did we got a mic? This mic work, Matt? Now this guy, he had cancer for two years, so maybe that's the reason he don't like, look too mean. <laughs> but he's mean as a snake. You know, every football team, you've got to have somebody that takes you to a, a different level of meanness, you know? We had one on our college team called Scrap Iron. Scrap Iron. It, to see him around campus, he was just like this guy. He was such a nice, easygoing, wonderful guy. But boy, you got him in the locker room and you put a little uniform on him, he was a different human being. He was like a guided missile. You know, all us quarterbacks, we wore different shirts out there. He didn't give a crap about that, you know. And the coaches kicked him out of practice a number of times because he was hurting our own players out there, you know. This guy, two, we had 250,000 crusaders and warriors at A.O. Williams. This guy was number one. He took us to a different level of toughness. I've never met his equal, ever. John, what did we go through the last couple of years? He had cancer. Yep. He, he built an organization. You know, uh, some of you don't think about, uh, uh, <laughs> some of you don't think you're going to ever get cancer, right? Some of you think you're not ever going to die, you know? And so you don't think about maybe my business one day, you know, needs to be something that's going to give me an income, right? John got cancer about two years ago. He's fighting for his life. He couldn't work, but he had built an organization. Hey, he used to make $12,000 a year as a football coach in Fort Lauderdale. Wow. But he all of a sudden was making $500,000 a year taking care of himself. But what was that like, John? Just, I mean, what did we go through together? Like you said before, we loved it. We didn't like this thing. We loved it. We got up every morning. I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. All I could think about is getting to the office because something's going to happen today. We didn't have a plan, but something's going to happen today. And that's the way we did it. We just put one foot what in front of the other. What happened two years ago when you got cancer? I mean, how bad was that? What was that like? Man, it was a shock. Nobody thinks they're going to get cancer. But... Um, this gentleman right here called me every night. I had to go through unbelievable chemo. I had to go through unbelievable radiation. And he would call me every night. And he'd say, hey, one more, one more day. It's going to be unbelievable. And, and, and you're the guy that kept me alive, Art. You kept me alive. Is that what? Hey. Hey. Is that what? Isn't that worth more than any override you make on somebody to have a relationship like that, you know? But anyway, John, you meant the world to all of us. John, to me, and his teammates were scrap iron. He was the toughest, meanest SOB that's ever been in A.O. Williams. He would get after you like you can't believe. And man, in my toughest of times, I knew there was somebody in Fort Lauderdale that would never quit. That would never leave me alone. He was the best. <laughs> See, Prudential, sold life insurance to make a living. We sold life insurance to correct an injustice. Prudential trained life insurance agents. We trained crusaders and warriors. Folks, don't, don't fall in the trap of training life insurance agents. Don't, tra don't fall in the trap of training. You, you, that's what it's all about. Man, you better find somebody that believes in you and you believe in them. I called him every night at 9 o'clock. Every night at 9 o'clock. 
If I could summarize uh, A.O. Williams versus the life insurance industry, everything the life insurance industry did, we just did just the opposite. Just did just the opposite. They built with full-timers. We built with part-timers. They trained life insurance agents. We trained crusaders. They talked a good game. We fought a good game. They were in it for the money. We were in it to correct an injustice. They dressed for success. We dressed for war. For 20 years, I never had any sales training. I never trained anybody in sales techniques. For 20 years, we trained across a kitchen table, live families with live problems. We trained across the kitchen table. We'd take that new recruit back to the office and we'd show him how to tear up a policy and how to make a proposal. I spent nine years in corporate America and I hated it. I hated it. And I think the thing that got me, the single thing that got me, you remember it, Bobby, and St. Petersburg, we were at a convention, and Continental Investment Corporation, a real estate company in Boston, had bought Waddell and Reed, and they had, had gone through a real estate depression, and they were like Citigroup, you know, and, and uh, they were taking Waddell and Reed's profits, and they were cutting our commissions and all that kind of crap, you know. And I kept telling the president of the company, I said, Look, I'm a vice president, and I got to go explain this to my guys. And at least give me the courtesy, if you're going to cut our commissions or do something like that, tell me so I can prepare them, right? And so we're down at a convention in St. Petersburg, and Bob Butterworth, who I hated, was the assistant to the national sales director, calls me. He, he loved delivering me bad messages, you know. And he called and he says, Art, uh, we just came out with our budget. There were 13 regions in Waddell and Reed. Three years earlier when I started there, we were... 13th place. Uh, three years later, we beat all the other 12 combined. But they came out with their budget and they said, okay, all the regions get to promote two people to division manager. That's like an RVP, you know, where they open an office and they pay the expense and all that kind of crap, you know. I had 19 guys and gals ready to be promoted. And I was going to have to wait another year. Can you imagine? And, and I told Butterworth, I said, Bob, you go tell Ben Corshot to stick it where the sun don't shine. And he said, Aren't you want me to tell him that? I said, You go tell him exactly that, okay? And I went home and I told Angela, I said, I'm getting out of Waddell and Reed. I might have to go back and coach, but if we can't start our own company, I ain't, I, I ain't, I'm never going to be in a company again where I've got guys, my buddies, my best buddies in life, like John Roy, that earns a promotion. And I got to look him in the eye and got to say, you got to wait one more year or, or, or whatever, you know. So February 10, when we founded A.O. Williams, we founded a company. Hey, hey, I found this old thing. It's hard to believe. I, I found this a, a long time ago, really. But it was a, a brochure. You know, when I started, uh, when I was, became president of A.O. Williams, I'd been in business nine years. You know, we had a lot of experience. It just wasn't like just our first rodeo, right? And... Uh, so, uh, this, this is this. This is our kind. Your number one responsibility is to build a team. A team is every player playing with one heartbeat. Now, this is back in 1977. Now, this is not something I invented. Everybody said, Bear Bryant, you say this. I read his stuff and all that crap, right? A team is every player playing with one heartbeat. Step number one, you must have a big goal and a big vision. We sat down and talked about that. We wanted to be prudential. We wanted to store trash value insurance, keep prudential, but become financially independent, all that crap. Step number two, you must have a plan. Our plan was to build an army of part-timers, to build an army of part-timers and have a few generals, to build seven to ten first-generation RVPs. Bobby, that's what we came up with. We said seven to ten. I don't know why we picked seven to ten because I had seven. We started with seven, so I reckon that's the reason we did it. Step number three, you must do it first. You've got to show it. Don't talk it. You practice until perfect. That's old, talk, that's old coaches talk right there, right? You field train until somebody becomes a district leader is one of the things I said. Step number four, you must deliver. You know, you've got to build a team and you've got to have one part-timer that's making money and building a team and then one RVP that's making money and building it. We used to say, you're not a sales leader until you build a sales leader. You're not a district leader until you build a district leader. You remember that, John? You're not an RVP until you produce an RVP, Right? Now you accept no excuses. Step number five, you coach your team. We don't want bosses in this company. We want coaches. You get the best out of people by encouraging them, 
building relationships, always being positive. You've got to become an expert in praise and recognition. It's all common sense stuff. It's nothing, you know, but, that, but we lived it. We didn't talk it. We lived it. Step number six, it was my way or the highway. There's only one head coach. You've got to have one head coach, right? I mean, each RBP is the head coach of his organization, right? But A.O. Williams ain't got but one head coach, right? See, I said the first rule is I want to start a company where you had no limits. I wanted every single piece of flesh that came to work at A.O. Williams to know that they, they could always make more money. Where, where could somebody like Andy Young go? Where bank, Andy Young's got a payroll right now, $30 million a month. Where could a guy like that, offensive lineman, hey, where my shirt? Come up here, Andy. See, see, let me tell you something. Ninety. Here, here's our, here's our, here's our game plan. Okay, we want ninety percent four and five corners. Right, that was it. Right, we had standards. Now y'all don't have no standards. Okay, we had standards back then. Right, ninety percent four and five corners. Right, that was influential people, leaders that had friends out there. And why would we do that to get us out of the cold market? Right, but we had. 10% exceptions. You know, you want to always make exceptions, right? But you don't have 90% exceptions like some of you and 10% standards, right? Well, this was the biggest all-time exception in the history of, uh, of A.O. Williams. He was a hog. You know, that's what you call offensive linemen. He was an offensive lineman at Wake Forest. So you have a uh, seven lineman. And you got, uh, you got seven hogs down there. Now, you don't want a team of hogs, right? But then you want a stud hog, right? And so you've got to have the ability to look at all these hogs out there and pick out the exceptional one. The guy that's got the eye of the tiger, right? And nobody's got the eye of a tiger like this hog. Ain't that right? Ain't that right? This is my hog. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. All right, now listen to me, folks. We're getting into some heavy stuff here. Now, we had A.O. Williams. When we started A.O. Williams, I wanted this company to have no limits. I wanted, every, I told you, I just read out our game plan, right? 1977, we wanted to produce RBPs, right? Now, uh, so we had no limits on the money you could make, no limits on the promotions you can get, no limits on the territory. You can go anywhere, right? Okay, now get that in your brain, right? Then we had to get this thing where it was simple and transferable, right? We had to simply, well, I already told you about all that, right? Okay, then we had to multiply. You've got to understand how to multiply, right? If you ain't got a team, if you ain't got a bunch of people out there to multiply to and transfer to, what the crap you got, right? Okay, now, our plan was to build RVPs. Our plan was to build seven to 10 first generation RVPs, right? Now, somebody said Primerica's plan is to build big base shops, you know? Now, maybe that's a plan. I don't know if you call that a plan or, or what, but. Anyway, I mean, I, I look at it and I say, well, our plan was to build seven to 10 first generation RVPs. Now, uh, what I would do, what we did, is we paid somebody, RVP, let's say Bob Buston, to build seven to 10 RVPs that, let's say, did $10,000 each. That's $100,000. Now, to me, that was more valuable than a $100,000 base shop and no RVP. Does that make sense to you people, right? So what I would do, what we did, I didn't what I would do, is I would pay this guy, let's say Bob Buson at Bill 7 to 10 first, $100,000, and this guy $15,000. Now you think that'd get somebody's attention? Huh? Now, now, why is that better? Why is that better? John Roy just told you he got cancer two years ago. He built an organization, never thought he'd have cancer, but for two years, he was making $500,000 a year, a former $12,000 a year football coach, right? 
That's why it's better. That's why it's better. Right? You build a base shop only, Gus. You get cancer, your income stops. That makes sense. And it's better for the company. I mean, I want to be prudential. I want to destroy trash value, right? So it's better to have 10 RVPs than one. Does that make sense? I mean, that ain't got no genius. I mean, it's just common sense, right? Now, look at this thing. Now, hey, this is the way the traditional industry built. The manager would go out, and he would recruit three people. And in 10 years, if you did that 10 times, it'd be 30 people. Well, at A.O. Williams, we wanted every new recruit to look at himself as building a team, right? I'll talk to you about that a little bit more tomorrow, right? But if you built three, and your three built three, and you did that 10 times, that's 59,000 people. That's how we did it. You look at every RVP as an RVP, as a future RVP, where they can build a big income and a secure income. That makes sense? We wanted dreamers. I love what Andy Young did. He don't know that I got this. But Andy Young sold a dream better than I sold it. He was young, 22, out of Wake Forest. And where's that town? Winston-Salem. And he, he stays there 18 months uh, building his business and decides to move to Washington, D.C., goes up there and lives with his family until he gets settled in. And he drew a circle. I did that same thing, Andy. I did the same thing when ITT moved me to Atlanta. I drew a circle 30 minutes around my house, okay? But Andy was smarter than me. He puts X's there, and he said, I want an RVP in all these places around. Uh, he started on his first recruits there. He said, I, this is what I want. I want you to be that guy right there that opens that office and becomes an RVP. You sell a dream. We sell a dream. And our dream at A.L. Williams was to build an army of RVPs in every city, every town, every hamlet, Right? And there was five parts that I'm going to talk to you about tomorrow. Look at that. We got five parts. You got to recruit right. You got to train right. You got to build trusting relationships. You got to sell the vision. And there's got to be one way. Everybody in A.O. Williams has got to be, you know, you almost couldn't get fired at A.O. Williams. I had one rule as a football coach. You had to come to practice every day. If you, unless you were in a hospital dying, you better be at practice, you know? Well, at A.O. Williams, we only had a couple rules. One of them is uh, you couldn't send them to sales trainers. Or you couldn't have different guidelines. You know, I'd fire your ass. And I had to fire one, Dennis Richardson, uh, for doing a bunch of crap. Now, now, you know what? I know some people, this is what City said. I, I used to have Oit Cooperman and Pete Dawkins. I, li I liked all those guys. I mean, they were good guys. You know, they just ain't ever done it before. One of my life lessons is you don't listen to nobody they ain't ever done it, right? That's the reason a college degree ain't worth nothing, you know? College professors don't know nothing because they ain't ever done nothing. So I don't listen to those jokers, right? I think that's the most useless thing in the world is, a, hey, a business degree from University of Georgia, I got grandkids that went... And not only is that diploma worth nothing, but these kids are leaving with 30,000 debt and 40,000. That's a big, that's politicians for you, right? That's the biggest disaster right now. One of them facing our country right now. So, so you know what? Uh, uh, those first Yaleys that city group sent down, you know, they'd come to my house. They say, Art. Now, you know, y'all just promoted all, all these RVPs, you know, and we ain't going to do that. You know, some of your RVPs out there doing 5,000 and 10,000, and we don't want nothing but do this 20, 20, and 30, 30, and 50, 50, and crap like that. So we're going to produce successful RVPs. We ain't going to do like you. That's people ain't ever done nothing, right? And so, uh, see, 95% of your RVP team is always going to be young and growing. Right now, you go check all your RVPs in Primerica, they all will be five, tens, 15,000. The home office people, they never sold nothing, built nothing. They think a $10,000 base shop is nothing. They, they, they thought like, that's just nothing, that's nothing. $10,000, nothing, nothing, right? That's a ball buster to do a $10,000 base shop, right? 
you better have a bunch of RVPs that are five tens and fifteens that are green and growing, right? And then you have five pence in that are like Andy, that are ball busters, right? They're big and multiplying. Does that make that make sense? So city, let me get <laughs> old city. They want only big RVPs. Y'all heard that little spill? Art Williams just produced anybody as an RVP, just anybody, RVP, right? Well, one of my theories is, is an RVP, you got the right to promote somebody early. You just ain't got the right to promote anybody late, right? Don't you ever hold somebody back or on fire your ass, right? But if you want to promote somebody or so, if we ever lost an RVP or guy quit, sometimes I'd promote two to replace him just to, just to prove to my team that I'm going to promote RVPs, right? So you, you run a business, you've got to do those kind of things, right? Well, so city, these Yaleys, uh, they wanted only big RVPs. So what they did is they lost half of the RVPs, right? And they ain't replaced them because they don't know how to replace them. And they ain't ever going to replace them at the pace y'all are going right now, right? Can y'all handle 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Y'all know what? See, I'm a swimmer. And since I had my partial knee replacement, I swim every day. I probably hadn't missed five days of swimming uh, in the last three years. At five o'clock in the morning, I'll be swimming. And I'll swim an hour and five minutes tomorrow morning or an hour and a half in five minutes. Now, you know why I spend another five minutes? Hour and five minutes instead of an hour? Because I never stop at the finish line. I always do a little bit more. See, A.L. Williams taught me that. That's so programmed in my life right now. At 76 years old, tomorrow at 5 o'clock, I'll be in the water and I'll swim an hour. But when I see that clock up there, I don't count laps, I count time. I say, well, I'm going an hour. I don't stop. An hour. And then when I get to an hour, I got to go. Another three minutes, another five minutes. Because I know Prudential's stopping at the finish line. Right? Ain't that right? See, so you got to learn as a leader to be an example, and you got to learn to reward and punish yourself. See, I sometimes in the morning at 5 o'clock, I don't want to get up and go swim an hour. I say, I'd like to stay in that bed and snuggle with Angie. She looks still pretty good at 76 years old, right? But you know what? You know what? I got to hit that pool. I got to hit that pool. And uh, so I learned this in coaching. At uh, in Thursday, right before we played on Friday, we'd go out in shorts, we'd loosen up, we'd go over our game plan, and we'd have a meeting, and I'd go over our goals. And I'd say, okay, guys, tomorrow, if we have a great offensive effort and we win by 21 points, let's say we hold them, score, beat them by 21 and nothing, we're going to go out in shorts on Monday. We're going to reward. It's nothing like winning and then going out in shorts on Monday. And your little girlfriend sitting on the hill up there watching you prance around. That's the ultimate, right? Now, I said also, if you go out there tomorrow and you win and you have a great defensive effort and you hold them scoreless, we're going to go out in shorts on Monday, you know? But you know what? You know what? Go out there tomorrow night and give a half-butted effort, Right? and you don't win by 21 points, or you don't win and hold them scoreless, then we're going out in pads on Monday. And it's going to be ugly. Right? Because we got to get better. Ain't that right? You've got to meet your goals. Right? It's got to reward. And you know what? what? If you get beat tomorrow night, I'll see you Saturday morning. Wow. See, I did that in A.O. Williams. When I went in A.O. Williams... I had this as a personal goal before I met Bob Buson and Rust in them. I tried to make a sale today. Monday through Friday, I wanted to make a sale every day. And if I made five sales, then I'd take the weekend off and reward myself and spend time with Angela and the kids. But if I didn't make my five sales, I'd work on Saturday. If I didn't do it by Saturday, I'd work on Sunday afternoon. You know? You got to reward and punish yourself in this business if you want to if you want to win. Why do we build for part timers? You can recruit better people, right? And you get in a warm market, right? 
you stay out of the coal market, right? That makes sense? 90% ought to be four and five pointers, and you ought to have 10% hogs. Ain't that right? But you don't just get any hog, right? You get the good hogs. Ain't that right? Andy Young, now look at this hog. 35 years, 198 RBPs, 34 SBPs, 21 NSDs, 7 SNSDs, four $1 million earners, $100,000, $600,000 earners, cash flow $1.6 million a year. Pretty good hog, right? What about Greg Fitzpatrick making $12,000 a year in Fort Lauderdale? You're talking about multiplying? 30, produced 334 RVPs, 43 SVPs, 25 NSDs, 9 SNSDs, $8 million earners, $244,000 earners, $1.5 million cash flow, monthly team cash flow, $5 million a month, $63,000 million a year. Mike Tuttle, if I had to pick out probably the best leader, well, not probably, the best leader in A.O. Williams at building relationships. He was the ultimate. He was my hero there. Mike Tuttle was in Campus Crusade for Christ. He had to raise his own money. Now, this is, I'm quoting him. His, his, one of his goals was to make enough money where he could rent a TV on Friday night and he and Stephanie could watch TV on the weekend. Is that unbelievable? Well, he comes to A.O. Williams with that heart, with that, that passion, that relate, build, build, ability to build relationships, people to trust him. He's got an organization right now of 25 people making a million dollars a year. He's a former campus crusade for Christ guy making $2.7 million a year. Those original people risk it all. Now, I'm closing now, so hang with me. I get emotional about this. I get emotional about this when I was doing it. I'd go around this company, first two years, and I'd say, folks, I'm telling every recruiting interview, every meeting I ever had, I said, the odds are like that. I want you to understand, the odds are like this. Jenny Carter, Jenny Carter, and you know, I always got these labels, you know. Uh, uh, Jenny Carter was the most courageous person I knew in A.O. Williams. It was a single mama of four kids at home making $75,000 a year at Waddell and Reed. That's like 200 and something thousand dollars, you know, today's income. Uh, have all her expenses paid and all that kind of, I spent hours with Jenny Carter saying, Jenny, are you sure this is something you want to do? Because we probably ain't going to make it, Jenny. Understand, she didn't hesitate a minute. Can you imagine? I couldn't do it. I don't think I could do it, John. I don't think I'm capable of being that tough. Most courageous person I ever knew was Jenny Carter. Man, our people risk it all. Bob Buston was making $100,000 a year, all his expenses paid. Bob Turley, $80,000 a year, all expenses paid. Jenny Carter, $75,000 a year, all expenses paid. Rusty crossed on a special program. Superstar in the eyes of Waddell and Reed. Bill Arenda offered my position, $120,000 a year, all his expenses paid. 650 securities, insurance licensed people in five states. And he had to come with us as a division manager. And I said, just trust me, Bill. Just trust me. If this works, and it probably ain't, I'm going to take care of you. And he came. And a year later, he, <laughs> we had all this problem with the Georgia Insurance Department. And I said, Bill, you, you know, you've earned the right to be promoted to RVP, but you can't stay in Georgia and be an RVP. You got to go somewhere. He chose to go to Dallas. And I said, Bill, I don't have any money to help you. I'm, I'm sorry. It broke my heart to see he and Carol hook up their trailer to their car and load their furniture and three kids and go to Dallas, Texas, not know anybody. Come, you don't pay him nothing. Larry Waddell went to Greensboro, North Carolina because he had to leave Georgia. Eves, come up here. Uh, you know, uh, we were going in Canada. We were going uh, in Canada. You know, I just put a map out of Canada, and uh, I said, uh, I said, you know, they're selling cash value up there. So we need to get some termites going up there, you know. And uh, 
So we spent a year, a solid year, you know, working with the regulators and all this kind of crap, you know, and they wanted us to come in there and bring jobs and all this kind of crap. And uh, so we go in there and yet the first month, those trash value guys got all over the regulators and they passed a law. We couldn't hire part-timers, the heart and soul of our company. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? But we didn't throw in the towel. We didn't give up. Uh, I called Greg Fitzpatrick on the phone. I said, Greg, I was coming out with these little videos. I said, I need some people in Canada to call. And uh, he said, call Eves and Jim Bone. I've never met Jim. And, but you know what? You just, like, just like with a hog. You know, you, uh, I don't know, you just have special feelings as a leader or you ain't no leader, you know? I fell in love with this guy. Do you know this is the first time I've touched him? But I bet you in the last, I don't know how many months, April. last April, we don't talk on the phone, but, but email, ain't that something? You know, but I tell you what, he loves Art Williams and I love him. How can you develop a relationship that by an email? Mm. He told me a story. I want you to tell it to me again real quick now because I'm tired. He's, I might got a sore throat and I want to go to bed because I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning and swim. And swim. <laughs> How far? Five minutes. An hour and five minutes, okay? Because I never do what? You never finish at the finish line. You no. always go a little bit more. That's right. Now tell me about why. I think you told me you were in Detroit and you were offered a job in your company to go to Hawaii or yeah. somewhere, and you wanted to go to Canada. Why do you want to go to Canada? Well, the thing is, you know, my uncle sold me three whole life. And, uh, your uncle? My uncle. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. You, <laughs> yeah, I know. So anyways, uh, an employee of mine came to the hotel, and he showed me about buy term and there's a difference, and I got pissed off. Excuse me. And uh, I turned down a transfer to go Did to you Hawaii. Did you say chicken shit? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And a few other things too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I uh, turned down a transfer to go to Hawaii, uh, quit 80000 sold my home, and moved to Montreal. And it, it was full time then. And, uh, you know, I'm the first French in, in Montreal. And uh, this guy saved my life. Because when we were uh, a peanut, all I had was his tapes. And that's, that's why I love you. I mean, you know, that's, that's how we build together. Because you're the one that, that really coached me. And, you know, I love Greg and I love Bob Miller. They came to, to Montreal to help us out. But this guy saved my life, you know, just because of who he is. And he was talking to me in my car. And that's how I was able to build full time for 26 years. Now we have part time. You know, so you know, I love you, you. I love you, buddy. And uh, you know, you told me I think you were financially independent now. Yep. And he could quit. And he told me those little videos I sent out, and we developed relationships. He said, Art, he told me one day, I don't know if you remember telling me this, you know, but he said, you know what? I want to go for it again. I want to go help people again, yeah, you yeah. know? Don't Definitely. have to, Definitely. don't have to work, you know? But he's that kind of guy. That's who A.O. Williams uh, was like. And you know, Ease, we're fixing to show you something right now. It's going to tear you up. <laughs> it's going to te tear you up. It's going to absolutely tear you up. This was our first employee at A.O. Williams. Trudy. And this, yep, Trudy. Trudy. And this, yeah, I sent him a copy. He's on my little inner circle thing, you know. And so I sent him my videos to help me check up on these people. <laughs> to make sure they do a right. good job. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is why we were good. It wasn't the system. That was part of it. The limit, no limits, and all that crap, you know. The kind of people that we had. I love this guy. He's my kind of guy. He's like, he's like, he's like. I am like you. I'm he's like him, him ain't he? That, that, I mean, he, I, I, I hugged him. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I love this I mean, guy. he just, that's the meanest guy you ever, that's me. He's so mean, he's unbelievable, right? But I'm telling you, see, he's that kind of guy you can be in that foxhole with, man. This is the kind of person you want. This is the kind of person you fix and see on this screen is what made A. Williams who we were. Let's run that score. Oh, wait, oh, yeah, here, I got a t shirt. For you. Ah. How about that? <laughs> First time I ever met this guy. You know, you know what? Uh, 
you know, I, you know, you got to become an expert on praise and recognition. You know, that was one of our, our goals, right? If you're going to be a good coach or whatever. And, uh, you know, we didn't have make any money back in the early days, but uh, this is the first T-shirt I've given you. I guarantee you this means something to him. The first time I touched him was tonight. <laughs> right? And, you know, you know we, I found that you could, you could put a little saying on these T-shirts, you know. But the, thing I've, the thing I've come to love about you the most, Steve, is you want to. You want to. So I can put this on a T-shirt. And, man, that says it all about him, right? You can put, I am a stud, right? Right? Here's somebody else you're going to love. How do you get people to trust you? There are five rules. Number one, you must always look for the good things in your people. Number two, you can't let the losers and the negative people and the dishonest people and the unethical people make you lose faith in people. Number three, you must show your people that you really care about them and their family and their dreams, really care. Number four, you must love them and believe in them through good times and bad times. When Angela and I had our two babies, Art and April, and when they were growing up through those difficult teenage years, we'd sit them down and we'd tell Art and April, we'd say, now listen, y'all, I know you're going to screw up. I, I hope you're careful. I, I know you're going to make mistakes, but I want you to know a couple things. Number one, I doubt you'll ever make as many mistakes as your mom and daddy made. And number two, I want you to know there ain't nothing you will ever do in your life. It is impossible. You can't make a mistake. I don't care what it is that would cause us to love you less than we do right now. I want you to know, I want you to know there is nothing you can ever do that you can't come home. You can't come home and your mom and daddy is going to be there to love you and fight for you. Number five, you must believe that you're working to make them successful. Your people must believe that you're working to make them successful. Never that they, that they think they're working for you to make more money, to win you a contest, to earn you a promotion. Let me give you another story that'll tear you up. It'll just tear you up. Trudy White was the secretary and office manager at our office in Fort Lauderdale. We developed a special kind of love for each other. When Coach Taylor retired from coaching, I opened an office for him in Tallahassee, Florida, and he didn't know anything about the business. He knew a lot about people. And so I moved Trudy White up to be his administrative assistant in Tallahassee, Florida. When I announced that we were leaving Waddell and Reed and starting A.O. Williams, man, World War III broke open. And one Friday night, I heard a knock at my door in Snellville, Georgia, and it was Trudy White. And I said, Trudy, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm coming. I, I said, you coming where? She said, I'm coming to A.O. Williams. I'm coming. I said, ain't no way in crap you're coming, Trudy. You've been at Waddell and Reed for almost 35 years. You've only got five or 10 years to go to retirement. You can't put that kind of pressure on me, Trudy. I, we probably ain't even gonna make it. And she said, I'm coming. I said, ain't no way in crap you're coming. She said, I'm coming. I had to listen for that crap for two and a half days. And Sunday afternoon, she came. Now folks, can you believe that? You can understand Rusty Crossland and some of these other people that had a chance to build their own company and build financial independence, but, but all she was going to be is an employee, was a secretary, but she wanted to be part of something great. She wanted to do something special with her life. When Trudy retired a few years later, she loved to travel more than anybody I think I've ever known. I gave her a lifetime airline ticket where she could go anywhere in the world at any time until she died. 